Hello, I'm Dr. Frederick Whitehurst. I was employed by the FBI for 16 years as an agent, the last 12 of those years at the FBI Crime Laboratory in Washington, D.C. After reviewing the results of a six-year investigation into the tragedy at Waco, Texas, I am convinced that the American people have never been told the full truth about that matter. Having served with the FBI's hostage negotiation team during this crisis, April the 19th would mark the end of one of my duties and the beginning of another. Unknown to me, my life was about to change forever as I would come to know what failure is. Today I saw the gates of hell. I saw the gates of hell. Holding a child in your hands that lost its life in a fire where the temperatures reached in excess of 3,000 degrees is something that pierced my heart. April 19th. Turned the TV on and there I saw the tanks ramming into the front of the building and the fire shooting out and it was just, it was horrifying. Mommy, he says, you know, they told us about that fire. He says, they said, my daddy and my brothers and my sisters are gone. Things will be set straight. People will know the truth of things. Today, two subcommittees undertake historic joint hearings on executive branch conduct during the, that led up to the events at Waco, Texas in 1993. In human terms, these hearings are about a tragic loss of life. Four brave young law enforcement officers lost their lives on February 28, 1993. A planned raid went badly and off course. These four agents, dedicated and proud, deserve our full respect. They did not choose to die, but like many others in the law enforcement community, they chose to serve. But this is a complex event. On April 19, 1993, after a 51-day siege, other decisions led to the use of so-called CS gas, and a fire broke out. The fire rapidly consumed the entire Davidian compound, killing all 22 innocent children and more than 60 adults. The truth behind that part of the tragedy is also important and is the obligation of those who have responsibility for oversight to pursue the truth relentlessly. The Branch Davidians were a Seventh-day Adventist, or a sect of Seventh-day Adventists. They were an offshoot, developed first in California, under the leadership of Victor Hodoff, he moved to Waco in 1934-35, founded a community called Mount Carmel. His followers, in turn, moved to the location we know in the early 60s. If you once get to know these people, they're different from you and me. 
they're more religious than you and me. They know the Bible better than you and me. They lived apart from the rest of us. They lived in a manner different than the rest of us. They had different marriage customs and different property practices than the rest of us have. And they had a religion that was absolutely incomprehensible to most Christians. Well, there were people from all walks of life, various nations, and um, a lot of them came from England. They were coloured people as well as white people. The majority of those people in there were not criminals in the sense of the word that we think about them. They were truly believing people. So I believe 99% of those people, their sole purpose was the attainment of eternal life, which is after all, what I believe all of us that, you know, uh, at least that are Christians and uh, believe in. The Branch Davidians believe, first of all, that as the remnants of the true faith, they would be attacked by a hostile army representing an apostate government, Babylon, they called it, and that it was their religious duty to defend the faith. In 1992, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms began an investigation into David Koresh for the possession of illegal firearms. They formed a dynamic entry plan to secure the premises and seize illegal weapons with approximately 100 federal agents and three helicopters, which would ultimately cost the lives of four ATF agents and six Branch Davidians. On February 28, 1993, at approximately 9.40 a.m., ATF agents, while attempting to execute a warrant, were met with heavy gunfire by a group of individuals occupying a compound approximately 10 miles northeast of Waco, Texas. The group is identified as the Branch Davidian. gunfight broke out that would become the longest shootout in American law enforcement history. According to the ATF, their men pulled up to Mount Carmel, piled out of their cattle trailers, went running towards the door, guns pointed, shouting, police, search warrant lay down. According to them, David was standing at the front door unarmed, and he shut the door when they started running towards him. And the next thing the ATF knew, it says, it was receiving gunfire from inside of Mount Carmel, in particular from behind that front door. He knew law enforcement was coming, and he was so diabolical that he laid an ambush David Koresh expresses this. He says in this tape that he went out on his porch. He said, stop, there's women and children in here. And a shot rang out and hit the door on, in, to, the, to the right. That door, he says, kicked. I went running down the hall and found Perry Jones laying in the hall, screaming that he'd been shot. Perry Jones was in his 60s. He was unarmed as was David Koresh. When they went to the front door, both were shot in the area of the front door. Uh, David was shot in the wrist. Perry Jones was shot in the stomach. And then he says, if you don't believe me, look at the videotape. I know you have that tape, he says. I saw you making it across the road. According to the agency, there were three or four video cameras pointed at the front door who could tell you everything that happened at the front door of that building that day. They claim they can't find a single one of them. Every one of those videotapes vanished. In addition to the missing videotape, the ATF's on-scene activity logs also disappeared. I'm sorry, sir, I, I just, you mentioned that notes were torn out of the surveillance log. I was just wondering, how does that happen? I don't know, sir, I, I had never heard that before. My dad's name is Perry Jones. He was an unarmed man. And uh, you guys just shot through the door and killed him. 
Thanks a lot. Well, Ballesteros was one of the first ones to the door, Officer Ballesteros, he's an ATF agent. And they had a plan that if the dogs came up to attack him when they came to the front door, that they were to shoot the dogs, to kill the dogs. And he testified at a pretrial hearing that in fact they did fire and shoot the dogs at that time. It didn't take much of a spark to get a war going. Gun shooting through the windows. Our room was shot up completely. I did my best at getting the kids under the bed. All of a sudden now there's, I don't know how many, 50, 70, I don't know, 100 people outside. But at some point before I got Jake and Brian under the bed, bullets came flying in my window. We're a law enforcement agency. We don't fire through walls indiscriminately at people. I greatly feared that they would come in, they would open that door, and even though I didn't have a gun, it wouldn't matter that they would shoot me and the kids. They had already shot at me through the window, and I had no clue what was going to happen. The government tried to say that everybody, they could put a gun in everybody's hand at the beginning and during the raid, and that's not true. Most people were, were unarmed. There were a few that had guns, and I admit that, and there were probably those that reacted to seeing David and Perry and others gunned down who responded by firing back, but it was not a general ambush as they would like you to believe. I am in sympathy with the families of those that lost, uh, the families of the four agents that died. I know what they're going through. We lost a lot of friends and a lot of our families. I lost a daughter inside Mount Carmel. <laughs> After about two hours, they, they had a, a real truce. It wasn't a pretty sight. I mean, there were grown men crying all around. There was a group of guys that were down on their knees and they were praying. Uh, very disturbing, you know, type thing. I don't think the deaths on either side were justified. As well as those wounded, Judy Snyder was shot while nursing her baby through the chest. Get my battery, John. Get my battery behind the bus. Immediately following the ATF raid, the Branch Davidians were charged with murder and conspiracy to commit murder of federal agents. A year later, the jury found all the Branch Davidians not guilty of both charges, but some were convicted of lesser offenses. Since the initial February 28th raid, a review is before federal court to determine if the ATF used excessive force while serving the search warrant. Sir, I've got people shot. Get the hell off of here. I'll get off the property. That's what I'm doing, sir. Have a respect. I am, sir. I'm chemo. You could have arrested me any day as I jog up and down this road. You could have arrested me going to town or going to Walmart. All this stuff you may, you guys may want to avoid and deny. And I do not appreciate it, and never will I ever appreciate somebody coming here and uh, pushing people around with guns. Hey, I'll meet you at the doorstep any day, you know, and somebody will get hurt. If you want to keep playing that game, I'm talking to you. Somebody's going to get hurt. Because this ain't America anymore when the ATF has that kind of power to come into anybody's home and kick doors down and things like that. Uh, 
Federal agents said they are headed back to the house, so this thing is not over by a long shot, and the only way that uh, this is going to end is, is for all of the people inside to die or to surrender, Brad. I was walking out. Uh, there wasn't any room in the car. Um, and when they saw me, they just swarmed on me. They're hitting me, trying to take my camera away from me, yelling at me. And after all this went down, the Secret Service asked me if I wanted to prosecute the agents. And I said no. I said, I understand them. And I was, I was their first vent valve. At this point, we were surrounded. At this point, we did not have a clue what the government, Babylon, in our opinion, was going to do in retaliation. But we knew it wasn't going to be fun. On the evening of February 28th, while Mount Carmel is under siege, three Davidians not present during the gunfight try to return home to their families. Two of the men are taken into custody, but Michael Dean Schroeder is killed. They say that they stopped them and they asked for who they were or whatever. I don't see how any of the ATF agents were close enough to ask him any questions. Michael Schroeder's body is left in a ravine for five days, 300 yards from Mount Carmel. According to the ATF statements, Schroeder refused demands to surrender and raised a pistol. Eleven agents fired on Schroeder. The autopsy report indicates that he had seven bullet entries. Why it takes so many fatal bullet wounds to knock somebody to the ground? According to testimony, as the ATF agents were walking away with their prisoner, leaving Mike lay there like a piece of meat, an ATF agent stated that they heard two more gunshots. Norman was picked up. He told the others when he was in jail with them, he said, after I surrendered, he said, and they were taking me away, he said, I heard two more shots up the back. Schroeder's autopsy report also indicated that there were two entry wounds behind his right ear, only two inches apart. The bullets passed through this blue stocking cap. However, the stocking cap was not examined during the autopsy, nor was any forensic testing conducted before Schroeder's relatives had his body cremated. I said, Mike ambushed them. There were 17 of them as against him, and they were dressed up as trees. They've got a lot to answer for. After the initial raid happened on February 28th, uh, we got several phone calls in from the ATF that said if they saw any movement inside the building, hands in front of the windows, if people were standing in front of the windows, that they felt that it was a threatening situation and that they would shoot us. On March the 1st, the FBI begins negotiations with the Davidians. Heavy military equipment is brought in and a stalemate begins that will last 51 days. Several adults and children leave Mount Carmel and are transferred to ATF custody. The children are turned over to Texas Social Services. We have 21 children that have been released to our care thus far. The youngest of those children is five months old and the oldest one is a 12 year old. The children appear to be smart and well educated, very sharp children. Um, they seem to have been very well cared for. In 
In early March, Koresh had promised to come out. But at the last minute, he believed that God had told him to stay in, to wait. During the siege, David Koresh believed that the Nahum prophecy was being fulfilled, in which we believe, spiritually speaking, it's talking about the One World Order. David Koresh believed that he was going to be the one that initiates the downfall of this One or New World Order, the fall of Babylon the Great by sacrificing himself and this denomination. The description of Nineveh in the book of Nahum, David likened to the description of this country, being old, stagnant in its ways. Um, and the battle that takes place talks about these chariots and shields being bloodied and what's not. And he likened that battle to what took place on February 28. To read Nahum or Habakkuk, and you're in it, you're experiencing it. It all fits together. It's all a conglomerate of different prophecies by different men at different times talking about a war with Babylon, a great war. These tanks are for solely defensive purposes, and they will not be armed. We have no plans to assault the compound. 2,000 years ago, hey, who believed in Christ's doctrine? A man had to die. <clears throat> no one would believe what he had to say. So is there a lesson to be learned by looking back at the history of the prophets that came contrary to what people looked for? Were they, they ever... killed Isaiah, they killed Hoshea, they killed Zechariah, and Jesus came to say in Matthew 23 to the Jews, Woe unto you that believe not all the prophets have spoken. So you know, today it's all together just totally uh, disregarded. Just another religious fanatic, just another religious group. Ever since the rise of television, there's been a merger of news and entertainment. Monster stories and fairy stories are good, simple entertainment. And here you have media from all over the world is flown in and expected by their home offices all around the world to uh, produce a story every day. I mean, the, the government could have just issued a press release every day and the media would have read it word for word. Um, over the over the air just I mean that's how uh, you know desperate it was what the public was seeing and hearing on TV during the siege demonized the people in that church uh, the, the ones that I met and knew the survivors were people that were basically just trying to get to heaven. The world can hate us, the world can laugh at us and taunt us all they want. The world's had 2,000 years to learn this book and there have been people all up until now who've been interested in it. Now people don't want the Bible anymore. People don't seem to want to read the Bible or, you know, they want to go to church and just be saved, you know? And that's great if that's how faith works, but if God has a will and it is written in that book, his spirit's written in the book through all the prophets, then there's a knowledge he wants us to know. And the knowledge is here and it's being revealed, and that, that, that's all I can say. By March 24th, 25 children under the age of 15 and approximately 54 adults remain inside the church compound as Steve Schneider negotiates with the FBI. Let's, let's reflect on this for a minute. Why were they there in the first instance? A good question. They good were question. there to serve and execute an arrest and search warrant. They never said anything, not by a bullhorn, not by a knock at the door, not by any reason. Not by any reason. Even before they got, just about the time they got to the porch is when David opened the door and poked his head out 
what we want to do and what we will do when it when the time is right is we will process the crime scene there you know that we know that that wouldn't be so bad the biggest okay. issue that i've raised with you dick is not that you would be here even or that the texas rangers but i am adamant about this part that the atf is playing the ones that came to this place and when i've heard on the press conference the outright lies and to think that that agency would be involved in any aspect of this from here on out blows my mind that that would even be allowed in america well, Steve, let's face it. There are some things that we will we will deal with when the time is right. No, no, and that no. Will be you done. start dealing with it now, so we can come out. I mean, that's one of the biggest reasons I have not been able to hurdle talking to the people, getting them to come out. Dick. Okay, Steve, why don't you and your family come out and then you handle these issues? Okay, why don't we How do that? How am I going to handle them? And I'll be li when I'll be shackled for hands and feet and, and throwing the key will be thrown away. Who's going to hear Steve. me? They're after blood. Come on, Dick. They put me in the jail in Waco here. After I'd been there a short period of time, they brought me in and a ju judge came and told me what I was being charged for. And he said, you're being charged for murder, conspiracy to murder. He said, it'll be 100 years, 75 or 50. They were assuring us that we would be cared for in a professional manner. Then you turn around and you've got people that are flipping you the finger over top of the tanks. They're dropping their drawers and burying their butts. And these are the type of people that you're supposed to go out to. I said I had heard that you guys had wrote on some of the windows there at Mount Carmel that we see you, David, et cetera. And I asked the agent, was, uh, was this true? And he said, yeah, it's true. And I said, aren't you guys concerned about when this is over, that the news media might see this and uh, think it a little uh, antagonistic on your part? He just looked at me and walked away. Everything flip-flopped from day to day. You went through a, a feeling of, of being real hopeful to you sunk at the bottom again. Because from day to day, you never really knew what was gonna happen, what the negotiations were gonna be. Steve? Yeah. There's been a change. The tactical people have changed the situation, and for security reasons and for safety reasons, no one is now authorized to come out of there for any reason. And what they're telling me is that if anybody does, they are going to be dealt with in such a fashion that the people will have to um, retreat back to the compound. What? I, I, I'm not, I'm missing, I guess, what you're saying. Are you saying, make it as plain as possible. The patience of the bosses is no longer where it was earlier. Okay, in this, in this I'm situation. about ready. Listen to me now, Henry. I don't really give up about your bosses. When you tell me one thing, or you tell us that is okay, and this Bradley comes up and says something contrary to what you are, you tell your bosses to get their butts together. Do you hear me? Would you respond to the allegations that the reason why we had a Waco is because the FBI was in disarray? It is obvious that from the time of the change in the administration, it was very clear that there was great discussion about the replacement of the director of the FBI. In a March 11th letter to President Clinton, Acting Attorney General Stuart Gerson recommends that the president rely on other FBI leadership to resolve Waco and dismiss Director Sessions. Chief among those mentioned in Gerson's letter is Assistant Director Floyd Clark. This situation created a competitive environment for the directorship of the FBI in the midst of a major crisis. I know this is a very political thing, and I agree that, uh, that uh, with your observation that it could be that the FBI was impaired in its ability. Certainly, I was impaired in my ability. 
FBI Director William Sessions attempted to fly to Waco during the siege to conduct face-to-face -face negotiations with David Koresh, but he was impeded by government officials in Washington, D.C. The reason Bill Sessions never came to Waco during the siege was that the Justice Department refused to let him board his plane. Everybody knows that I had contact directly from people associated with Mr. Koresh about the possibility of my going down and negotiating with them, coming in down there. Now, some people played that as ridiculous and ridiculed it, or as grandstanding, but it's indicative of what I felt and continue to feel. You can't discard any possibility that you can resolve that kind of circumstance when you can take and apply that negotiating capability. The Justice Department wouldn't allow an FBI director to go and negotiate directly with a so-called terrorist who they felt had killed a number of federal agents, more or less in cold blood, and try to defuse a serious situation that ended up in a calamity and a great embarrassment for the FBI and even greater embarrassment for law enforcement in general. And, and it was all politics. And they were not about to see this standoff in Waco negotiated again because it was an opportunity for Floyd Clark and company to show that they were, uh, were the FBI capable of handling a standoff and coming out winning uh, in this kind of an incident with military kind of tactics. It was a paramilitary organization. Maybe you might ask them if you can have some ice cream, too, huh? Can I have some ice cream? <laughs> a little bribery there. You know, you're, right now you're considered a, a big terrorist, you know, and you can demand some important things like a, a, an ice cream or something, you know. Maybe they might adhere to you. By late March, the FBI has cut off electricity to the compound and is preparing a series of military tactics to force a resolution. A direct quote from the transcript where it is said by a negotiator to Mr. Koresh, we had a very di good dialogue last night. The electricity will not go off tonight because we have had a good dialogue this evening. As a negotiator to Mr. Koresh. A half an hour later, no, I'm sorry, it's a negotiator to Mr. Steve Schneider. A half an hour later, the lights are turned off and left off permanently. The electricity is shut off. Why? I, I can't answer the why, but I, I can uh, tell you that the negotiation team was disappointed in that decision. Since mid-March, negotiations have begun to fail, and the FBI resorts to psychological warfare. I don't appreciate the music. You don't? I'm trying to sleep at night from the music. I thought you being a teenager, you might uh, like well, some I of those sleep, uh, Martian sounds. My, my little sister. She's... Oh, I see. We went through varying degrees of hell with noise, music, bright lights, the children were suffering along with the adults. We were without water, having had our water tanks shot up, we were living on rainwater. Whenever it would rain, people would put buckets out the window and collect rainwater, and it was rationed. I doubt whether anybody got more than eight ounces a day, if that. How long do you sit with that many resources tied up and, and disrupting a whole community uh, with people that, that are violating violations of the law, that are in fact in a state of anarchy. I can remember looking out the south side of the building. Uh, my attention had been drawn to the fact that the tanks were coming in and they were pushing all the uh, things on the south side of the church, on the chapel, south side of the chapel, into a big heap. It looked like they were building a bonfire. We know from the evidence that the tactical element of the FBI was eager to put a quick end to this standoff. The irony of the situation 
is that the tactical people are actually precipitating the crises of the 19th. They tell me the commanders want more, and I'm telling them they're wrecking everything that we're doing, and it's getting 10 times worse. And, and the more they threaten these people, the more they'll lay down right on the floor, and they can run the tanks over them. I mean, that's, that becomes the attitude. Steve Snyder, in a telephone call during the standoff to his sister, Sue, refers to the prophecies in the book of Nahum, chapter 2. We're talking about the Bible and all the prophecies. But I know. Look at, when, when you get off the phone, you look at the book of Nahum. Yeah. The, the chariots with flaming torches are tanks. That's what Nahum saw in the final days. They are surrounded us. It's the first time in the history of the United States that the government has used tanks against its own people, Sue. So it's stupid, I know it. Well, I had been talking to the negotiators myself, and I, and, and I would tell them things that I thought would help. And it seemed like, like for instance, when they started playing the music, that w er, they would laugh. They acted like they wanted to do everything to antagonize them. They really didn't want to help. And it just seemed like every prediction that David was predicting, they knew about, and they were making these predictions come true. And I kept saying to my family, why are they doing this if they want them to come out? I am bewildered in the wake of Jonestown why more time wasn't spent and somebody, not out in the plains of Waco, but maybe in a nice comfortable office in Washington, didn't immerse themselves in the religious tenets of this Branch Davidian group. If I knew about the, the, his plans to burn the place, I would, we'd had a whole other approach with him. We know about your plan to burn the place uh, and destroy your people. We would have been broadcasting it. We would not even come close to approaching that place. Numerous microphones were planted inside of Mount Carmel that recorded several conversations of the Davidians reacting to the tanks and the FBI hostage rescue team. I mean, if, 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 if they're going to come inside here and storm this place, they're going to be in the wrong. Who's Lewis and Steve that they think they're going to go out there and stop the Assyrian when it's God's will that the Assyrians out there? They can't destroy us unless it's God's will they do. Haven't you read Joel 2 and Isaiah 13 where it says he's going to take us up like flames of fire? I trust in God. The FBI cannot get up here and say they did not know that David Koresh would respond when they made that assault. They knew that David Koresh was going to respond by trying to burn the place down, and they knew that because they had overheard uh, undercover tapes and because they'd had prior negotiation tapes with him. You know, it's, you know, things are only going to get worse out there. This whole situation is not going to go away. You know and I know the only way we're going to resolve this situation is you folks come on out. That's, that's the end of it right there. And now you were going to have to work to a point where this is going to happen. And now the trick is, how? In a situation like this, hey, there's, that's the answer. I'll tell you what, it definitely is an unusual situation for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, sometime when you have a chance to read Isaiah 33 about people living in fire and walking through it and coming out and surviving, seriously, who can, it says, who can dwell in everlasting burnings? That's the question. There is a tradition uh, in the Branch Davidian history, that God would, in the end time, protect his people through a wall of fire. They understand the Bible prophecies to be warnings of what could happen, but not necessarily what must happen. Koresh wrote a letter to his attorney, Dick DeGarrett, in which he said he had good news. God had spoken to him the waiting period was coming to an end. He and all the people could exit Mount Carmel and go through the system. But first, he was commanded to write down the meaning of his message, the meaning of the seven seals. After he wrote that manuscript, he and all the people were commanded to leave. They actually had no choice to remain. God had told them to leave. This message is communicated to the FBI in an attempt to end the siege. Koresh writes his first seal and is preparing the second when the FBI begins implementing its final tactical resolution. They've been knocking down trees and dragging things off from outside Mount Carmel, little by little for several weeks. 
On the 18th, they got rid of everything that was left. It's just like the papacy during the Dark Ages. When they thought people were heretics, they went in and dealt with them. That was the way they believed. And, you know, we have to all follow our conscience. That's why America is supposed to be a great nation where we can follow our conscience according to our beliefs. There was a, an aura there that we're going to end this thing. was inserted using a Mark V delivery system secured to a boom. We would not use dosages that would, would harm those children. The, the FBI's position on this from day one was to be very deliberate, very careful, and not to do anything that would be provocative, that would cause some reaction. There were no injuries to FBI agents, and FBI agents did not return any fire throughout the entire day in spite of being fired upon numerous times by occupants of the compound. was for this to continue for 48 hours, but there was a catch to the plan. If the tanks took fire from the Davidians, they were then allowed to escalate the plan. According to the official briefing given to Attorney General Janet Reno by the FBI on April the 12th, the assault plan called for demolition of the building and permission to shoot streams of automatic weapons fire into the building to support an armored vehicle's approach. And we told them what was going to happen. This tank's going to come up. It's going to insert gas. We're not entering the compound. We're not fulfilling this prophecy. Don't presume that. Was the Attorney General warned that while we'd been very cautious about selecting what your experts say or experts say was non-lethal gas, we might still crush sections in the building? Did she understand that people might be killed? I, I find an inconsistency between the efforts of the gas insertion plan to save life and, and the actions of this tank. At Mount Carmel, you had people that were confined to an area. Where were they going to go? Who were they going to hurt? They ran out of gas canisters, I think about 10 o'clock in the morning. Everything they'd planned for 48 hours was gone by then, and they were flying in more from Houston. The CS gas used at Mount Carmel was more potent than normal tear gas. CS gas would induce nausea, vomiting, and disorientation. As the FBI tanks demolished the building, the gas was dispersed from high-pressure bottles mounted on the boom of the combat engineering vehicles. Any indication about danger or harm to those children, the rule was back off. One of the first locations gassed by the FBI is the buried school bus, the entryway to an underground storm shelter. Following the gassing, the mothers of the children take them to an enclosed concrete vault, which the FBI calls the bunker. The FBI gasses the bunker for two hours. Approximately half of a panel that we had testified that some of the infants and children uh, since they didn't have gas masks, could in fact have died from inhalation or effects of CS gas. 
At the very least, the uh, Department of Justice decision, in fact, resulted in the babies and children being tortured for at least uh, three to four hours. I'd been told that earlier in the morning uh, that the filters wouldn't last long. When it did block up, I'd taken my mask off only to find my face burning and stinging. It was like you had acid all over you. Some of them were trying to wipe it off with minimal amounts of their drinking water on and perhaps a, ha a rag or, or whatever, only to find that it, it made it worse. So as I say, what the children were going through, only God knows. I saw grown grown men, adults, crying because of the, the sensation of the gas. Uh, as I say, we were fortunate in as much as we were not in an enclosed environment like the children were, being sprayed point blank and not having any ventilation. We are now at, at what we believe is the next logical juncture of putting sufficient pressure on them to cause them to come out. We saw a, a hole that a tank had made in the south wall of the chapel, and uh, we were kind of standing right just inside of that. There was a heap of rubble, uh, sheetrock, and two befores that the tank had pushed in. We were standing just a little back from the hole, uh, trying to decide whether if we went out, we would be shot. And as we were standing there, others were kind of coming in behind us. Next thing I knew, I kind of turned, was looking out the hole again, and all this smoke came down the outside of the building and got sucked in the hole where we were, and the whole place turned pitch black. That was the first indication that I recall of, of any evidence of fire. statement by you that they committed suicide, since we never got to talk to them, is all a conclusion that you've drawn, and as you just said, speculation on your part. I'm trying to, to, to resolve in my mind why someone would sit in there for six hours with gas and not come out with a full opportunity to come out. Well, Who see, was but, keeping them from doing it? Or are they compelling themselves or what? I don't know. I'm just, it's, it, it has to be speculation. I, I, I think that's the point is we don't know. so black you couldn't even see the flames. You could just feel the heat, oppressive heat that pushed you down on the ground. And I can remember looking at my hands and the skin was just rolling off. There was no blister. They were just rolling uh, off in, in whole layers, you might say. And uh, I looked back over my shoulder and I was just horrified at the fact that I'd just come through a mass of flames. heard some people screaming, kind of high-pitched screams. It didn't sound anyone was like a scream of fear, it sounded like more of a scream that someone was getting burnt. We were hoping that the women in that compound would grab their children and flee out. That did not occur. Unfortunately, they bunkered down the children the best we can tell, and they allowed those children to go to, up in flames with them. David Koresh, Steve Snyder, 52 other adults, 25 children, and two trauma-born infants perish in the April 19th fire. The Davidian survivors were taken into custody by FBI agents on the scene. Let's go. Clive Doyle and other injured Branch Davidians were given emergency treatment at the FBI command post. Yeah. 
The uninjured Davidians were transferred to the custody of the ATF and booked into the county jail. The reason we didn't wait was the thing I've tried to say several times, I'm not saying it but well enough, is that from his actions on the 19th, when he made the, when he had some of those people killed when he, and by gunfire, others died in the fire for not being able to leave, which I think they were concerned over most of them their salvation. That's, that was his hold over them, is that he would dictate when that occurred. Many people would argue your actions. How do you respond to their families? It's not because of our actions. Those children are dead because David Koresh had them killed. There's no question about that. He had those fires started. He had 51 days to release those children. He chose those children to die. I don't know who started the fire or fires. I don't know who fired bullets into these people's bodies. I don't know from what origin the bullets came from. So if we could completely agree that we do not have a definitive answer of the sourcing, then in fact what we have is an open homicide. Is there anything that we've missed that we should go after in the remaining two days? Yes, sir, I think we've uh, missed some of the uh, questions as to, as I mentioned earlier, why items of evidence have disappeared, why the crime scene was destroyed before it could be evaluated, uh, these areas, especially the evidence disappearing. I mean, you have, in essence, a crime scene that was so seriously flawed through ignorance or through an air of an elite mentality or in fact there was a conscious decision made to not collect evidence for any sort of serious examination other than to try and prove that the Davidians had weaponry and firepower enough to kill federal agents. Some of these bodies exhibited characteristics of perhaps being shot. Did anyone fire from any other location? The information that we've always been given was that there was no federal gunfire on the, on the day of uh, April 19th. Well, in reviewing the, the photographs and the 302s, uh, the statements in them, uh, I would say there are some questions that, that need to be answered. The FBI named the sniper positions Sierra 1, Sierra 2, Sierra 3. On April 19th, FBI Special Agent Charles Riley stated in his after-action report that he had heard shots fired that morning from sniper position number one, the undercover house. The position was occupied by the Blue Sniper Team, led by Special Agent Lon Horiuchi. Horiuchi stated that neither he nor his snipers fired their weapons on April 19th. The fact that Agent Horiuchi uh, states in his 302 that the snipers at Sierra One, which was the undercover house, did not fire, and there is a shell casing, expended shell casing there visible on the floor, would also raise a question. Four expended shell casings are later found at Sierra One, the location of Agent Horiuchi's Blue Sniper Team. What makes this particularly interesting is Mr. Horiuchi, uh, coincidentally, happens to be the FBI agent who shot and killed Vicki Weaver at Ruby Ridge and has been charged with manslaughter by uh, the state of Idaho. In August 1992, white separatists Randy and Vicki Weaver were involved in a standoff with the FBI at their mountain home. Agent Horiuchi shot and killed Vicki Weaver, who was standing in the window of the door holding her 10-month-old daughter. She was standing there holding a baby, or baby in her arms, holding the door so we could get in after they'd wounded me. And this guy is still running free. 
According to an internal federal government investigation, Horiuchi's shot is termed unconstitutional. Lan Horiuchi was never tried. Seven months later, he was the leader of the Blue Sniper team at Waco, accompanied by most of the FBI team from Ruby Ridge. Our desire was to get them out to use non-lethal means in a systematic manner so that they would come before the bar and face justice. We did not want this to occur. At some point, we had to up the ante. He was continually fortifying. He was demanding and was seeking provocation to get into a shootout with us, which we were refusing to do. According to the FBI's on-site activity log, at 9.03 a.m., FBI command advised Sierra 2 that an unknown subject could be seen traveling on foot at the back of the building. In this aerial photo, taken at approximately 9 a.m., a Davidian appears to be leaving the building and walking toward the back of the compound. The log indicates that Falcon 2, an FBI helicopter, took off to intercept the subject. As it approaches Mount Carmel, several flashes can be seen coming from the side of the helicopter. Dr. Edward Allard, a former supervising scientist in video and television imagery at the U.S. government's Night Vision Directorate, examined the helicopter footage and concludes that the flashes are gunfire. When we analyze these flashes, as we have done, in 1 60th of a second time frames, it appears that there's three shots coming from the helicopter, but in fact, each one of those three shots can be broken down into 1 60th time frames, 60th of a second, and we find, for instance, in the first uh, flash, there's five separate shots being fired. And it's uh, indicative of a uh, of machine gun that's firing at about 600 rounds per minute. In this view of one of the FBI's helicopters, a pedestal-mounted machine gun can be clearly seen in the doorway. FBI agents did not return any fire throughout the entire day in spite of being fired upon numerous times by occupants of the compound. On the other hand, since this is on a helicopter, and people might say that it's reflections from uh, the, the windshield, it's impossible for these shots that you're seeing with your own eyes uh, to be solar reflections. Because if it were so, the helicopter would have to be violently moving back and forth like a mirror in your hands. And this is impossible. So it's, uh, it's in our opinion, it's clearly machine gun fire from the helicopter. In coming out, the conversation, as I remember it, was, well, if we come out, will we be shot? According to the autopsy reports, Philip Henry was shot several times in the chest, shoulder, and head. Jimmy Riddle was shot once in the forehead. Neither of them had soot accumulation in their trachea or bronchial tubes or carbon monoxide in their blood, indicating that they died before the fire started. Later, when I saw the autopsy report and seen that he died of a gunshot wound to the head, it made me wonder if it was, in fact, the snipers that were in, in the barn, garage, that was in the back of the property. The autopsy reports also indicated extensive body mutilation to Philip Henry and Jimmy Riddle. The entire right side of Riddle's body, from the shoulder to the hip, had been torn away. In previous testimony, Dr. Nizam Pirwani, the medical examiner, observed that this could have been the result of the collapse of the building or an encounter with a tank tread. Philip Henry's body was interred during the year following his death. However, a new autopsy was requested by Jimmy Riddle's relatives to settle the circumstances surrounding the missing portion of Riddle's body and the gunshot wound to his head. Dr. Ron Grazier, the forensic pathologist who conducted the examination, concluded in his findings that the damage to Riddle's skeletal remains is consistent with a tank having torn the body apart. A forensic examination of the bullet entry wound in Jimmy Riddle's skull could not be conducted because the evidentiary portion of the skull was missing. Dr. Pirwani performed the original autopsy and was asked to provide a certified copy of his report for comparison. According to Riddle's relatives, the local Texas authorities and U.S. Marshals refused to allow Dr. Pirwani to turn over the documents.
We got to Dr. Pirawani's office trying to get the information on my brother, Jimmy Riddle. Uh, Dr. Pirawani told me that uh, he didn't know why they kept trying to keep the information from us. He didn't know what they were hiding and that he had the information, but he was ordered by the U.S. Marshals and the JPs not to release any information to me. While Americans were watching events unfold at the front of the building, the FBI's infrared video shows what took place at the rear of the structure. What a flare really does is it takes a invisible radiation, which is called infrared radiation, and it converts it into visual radiation, you might say, that we can see with the eye. What we have here is a, a tank infantry type of an operation. As the tank moves forward, two men have dropped out of the escape hatch. Uh, they roll over, and as they roll over, they open up with automatic gunfire. We've measured the actual time of the individual flashes, and they occur at a fraction of a second, in some cases, a thirtieth of a second. There is absolutely nothing in nature that can cause thermal flashes to occur in a thirtieth of a second. Somebody related or who had prepared a film or analyzed a film, representatives of the department and representatives of the FBI went over it in detail and concluded that there was no basis for suggesting the shot, that shots had been fired. As the tank crushes the roof of the gymnasium, gunfire can be seen streaming into the dining room from positions in the courtyard. I stopped counting after about 62 individual shots. Interviewed on NBC's Meet the Press on May the 4th, 1997, FBI Director Louis Free stated that no shots were fired by any federal agents outside of the compound and that allegations raised about gunfire seem to be based on some inferences from infrared flash patterns and heat patterns. I think the overwhelming evidence clearly shows that no shots were fired. It's uh, indicative of sunlight reflecting off something and registering on the flare. It could be a thermal pattern. If it were a thermal pattern, there is nothing that persists from that. Right. So therefore, it is more likely to have been reflected light off of something shiny in which the sunlight now gives an apparent temperature rise. From the basic physics, it's safe to say that it's impossible for the Waco flare to detect any solar reflections of any kind. On our wish list as investigators was taking a harder look at the flare. The congressional staff was never able to find or take advantage of a, a genuine flare expert to watch the flare video with us and to understand exactly what we were seeing. By comparison, this Department of Defense FLIR video, taken in Somalia in October of 1993 as troops exit a helicopter, shows gunfire similar to the thermal signature on the FLIR videotape at Waco. A former analyst from the U.S. intelligence community, Maurice Cox, tested the FBI's claim, applying the principles of solar geometry. For an aircraft flying at an altitude of 9,000 feet, a flash anomaly occurring on the ground would be visible in an area only 100 feet wide. Frame-by-frame -frame measurements of the FLIR videotape showed a repetition of 10 flashes per second, the same rate as a machine gun firing at 600 rounds per minute. According to the Sunlight Reflections Report, in order to duplicate these multiple flashes, the reflective surfaces would have to be exactly the same shape and size and positioned in an array too precise to occur by chance. To record sunlight reflections at 10 flashes per second, the FBI's small aircraft would have had to travel at Mach 1.8, nearly twice the speed of sound. The Sun Reflection Report concluded that the flash signatures on the Waco FLIR video could only have been caused by gunfire. In January 1999, Mr. Cox challenged Director Free and Bureau scientists to disprove his findings. They did not respond. If someone comes to me 
to understand the data. I need to tell them the uncertainty associated with it. If the government is only telling them uh, this was not a field of fire, well, the government is refusing to look at this and anybody with their plain eyes could see, well, something's going on there. You know, when you think of the fact they're shooting automatic weapons fire into a building with children in it, there's something wrong. Dr. Allard has stated that this video shows gunfire being directed into Mount Carmel from the outside of Mount Carmel on April 19th. The only people that could have come from would have been federal agents. Other flashes can be detected on the FLIR tape within an hour of the fire, such as this detonation in the courtyard, which has a thermal signature that is consistent with a hand grenade exploding. And more gunfire can be seen near this tank. But if the FBI's claim is true, and the hostage rescue team didn't fire at Ranch Davidians, then there is another possibility. According to what we saw written in the Book of Nahab, we were to undergo a military-style attack. We were to be attacked by tanks and people from the military. On the use of military personnel and heavy equipment against U.S. citizens, other questions linger. How much was used and why? There was concern expressed that the FBI had only one hostage rescue team and, and they were tiring. Do you recall that uh, conversation in that meeting? I, I recall, I, I believe I asked for that meeting, yes. On April 14th, just five days before the fire, a meeting was held between Attorney General Janet Reno, the FBI command team, and Special Forces Commanders Brigadier General Peter J. Schumacher and Colonel Gerald Boykin of Delta Force. The purpose of this meeting was to convince Reno to authorize a final assault at Waco. Military is trained to find, fix, and destroy the enemy. You don't worry about warning your military enemy of constitutional rights. What is generally known, or, or known in public as, the, as Delta Force, is in reality called Combat Applications Group. So anybody who asks about Delta will get told with a straight face by the Army that no such organization exists. What organization does exist is Combat Applications Group, and their stated mission is to perform counterterrorism operations overseas in defense of U.S. interests. Uh, earlier in an opening I gave this morning with regard to the Posse Comitatus Act, uh, just to refresh my colleagues' memories, the Posse Comitatus Statute is a criminal statute uh, that states that it's a crime to use any part of the Army or Air Force to enforce the laws of the land unless authorized by Congress or the Constitution. There is, in my judgment, it is absolutely clear that no law was violated, no action was taken that comes close to violating Posse Comitatus or any other law. Uh, General uh, Huffman, is that your, do you agree with that? Congressman, so far as the Army's involvement in this, I would say that is correct. This yes, right here. Right. Question about the, 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 the uh, Army Delta any terrorist team or any other military uh, operational <laughs> asset? The, the question is, are we getting uh, any help from the, from the military? The question is, are we getting help from the Delta team, and we're not. In mid-March 1993, I attended a senior executive staff meeting at CIA headquarters, and it involved senior agency management along with uh, the liaison officers from the U.S. military, in particular from Delta Group. Uh, the briefing centered on Delta's operations in Waco, Texas. This previously classified military document confirms the presence of Delta Force at Mount Carmel. With approval of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, an observer was deployed to the scene on March 21, 1993, accompanied by three other operators also characterized as observers. One particular uh, soldier was questioned uh, by a member of the hearing and pressed and pressed. He did not want to reveal even the existence of Delta Force and finally had to admit that they were present. Originally I was told that there was just going to be one or two Delta personnel there as observers, but during the briefing it was mentioned that there was over 10 Delta operators 
at Waco, Texas, and they were not there merely as observers, but would be participating in any type of operational or tactical effort against the Branch Davidians. My understanding is that in some way, uh, the U.S. military, Delta Force, were advising the hostage rescue team from inside the tanks or inside the Bra uh, Brady fighting vehicles, or were present at the sniper posts uh, to provide support or assistance. And those types of activities, to me, would mean forward deployed. They were not uh, back uh, at a conference room or table giving advice or saying you ought to think about this. You thought they were out there uh, working shoulder to shoulder with the uh, HRT. Approximately a year after the uh, Waco incident, I was deployed overseas in Europe, and I had the chance to. Uh, uh, meet some of the Delta operators that I had been on previous assignments. Uh, they had told me at, at several, on t several different occasions during my meetings with them in Europe that not only were they forwardly deployed at Waco, Texas, but they were actually involved in a gunfight with the Branch Davidians. When you see the uh, individuals roll out from the tank and come around the sides and start shooting into the building, what they're doing is they're defending the vehicle. If HRT or combat applications group, uh, whoever was pulling the triggers, uh, expected resistance, ex expected shots to be fired, then their moves on April 19th made tactical sense. But uh, I did talk to some combat applications group uh, guys, and they did confirm that yes, uh, portions of B squadron were there uh, pulling triggers. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the flash is on FLIR tape uh, was far from uh, semi-automatic or automatic weapon fire being returned into the building. I mean, it's inconsistent to even think otherwise. The, uh, there were people there on the ground with automatic weapons, and flashes such as that only come from one thing, and it comes from uh, rifle barrels that are, th that are firing back into the building. Their operators had penetrated the, uh, the buildings on several occasions, planting uh, surveillance devices, listening devices, uh, sensors. And on one occasion, uh, I believe it was April 17th, late 17th, early 18th, uh, Koresh was actually within six feet of one of the operators, and they radioed back to the Tactical Operations Center for permission to grab him. Uh, within minutes, the word came back from Justice Department, no, we already have a plan in place. That plan, of course, uh, being what happened on April 19th. To me, that, that would be a, an offensive gesture. When you enter someone's home, that's pretty offensive, and uh, I would personally have a, a problem with that. I, I think that it, it violates uh, everything that I've been taught that you don't use the military against civilian personnel in this country. What about other reports that the uh, military Delta Force may have uh, been involved in one way or another? Will you make an inquiry into that as well? We will pursue any issue that is at, at, in question. I will not let this become a show trial with law enforcement as the defendant. These Waco hearings must not degenerate into a kangaroo court. It is unfair for us today to look at what law enforcement did at Waco in a vacuum. And it is unfair to twist the facts, making law enforcement the villain and David Koresh, the lawbreaker, the victim. David Koresh, you may not think he was innocent, the mothers and the fathers of the children, you may not think, were innocent. But those 17 children that died here were truly innocent. We had heard during the meeting uh, various scenarios that they were going to use down in Waco, Texas to try to be, uh, bring a speedy recovery or a speedy end to what was taking place down there. And at that time, gas was talked about. Uh, uh, a couple other uh, situations, non-lethal situations were talked about. And the primary concern around the table was a lot of the people that, a lot of the Branch Davidians that were inside that building were, were willing or did not want to end their lives in such a fashion, especially the 17 children that were down there. Where's God sit? On the throne? Where's that at? Point. Where's God live? Is he going to save you? How come? Well, people ask why we didn't let the children out. If they saw all that was happening 
and they were in there with their children, would they have sent them out to the animals outside that were shooting at them and doing all those terrible things? No. Federal law enforcement officers obviously did make some tactical errors prior to and during this tragic incident. And I hope this body, somebody, holds them accountable. Please, I'm pleading with you, somebody out there in the federal government still screwed up big time, okay? But they didn't start this fire. Based upon the ATF's arson investigation, accelerants were used at all points of origin of the fire. Uh, there, are, there is no disagreement between us that this fire was intentionally started inside the compound by the people in there using flammable liquids as accelerants. I don't remember who it was, but he was pouring this liquid on the floor. And Papa was saying, don't pour it inside, pour it outside. It was clear to us from listening to those tapes that the government was going to be able to prove that the Davidians, at least some of the Davidians, had a plan and that some of the Davidians were aware of this plan. I'm sure that the, uh, the FBI down there had a lot of fiber optics, audio and visual equipment installed in the building there. I'm sure they knew exactly what the branch Davidians' plans were, what their intentions were, if there was uh, an attack against the building, such as a gas attack like that. If they believed we were going to try to enter the compound, and, uh, and then the way the, the uh, over here sounded, like there was one comment, that we're going to wait until they come in before we light this. Why in the world would the, would the FBI make the assault knowing that information? It borderlines on criminal misconduct for the FBI to make that assault when they knew that he was going to respond like that, particularly on the most windy day of the year. The FBI claimed that it never used pyrotechnic CS rounds, munitions capable of starting a fire. However, in this footage made prior to the fire, two agents are seen firing projectiles from an M79 grenade launcher into the storm shelter at the north end of the building. Seconds later, white smoke pours from the shelter. According to CS expert Colonel Rex Applegate, any tear gas that creates smoke is considered pyrotechnic. There have been some, some uh, unfortunate reporting talking about that if tear gas were utilized, it would deprive the children of oxygen and it perhaps could be fatal. What they were describing is not the type of tear gas that we, were, that we are using. We're using a non-pyrotechnic type tear gas, which does not deprive them of oxygen. So it is not a lethal type gas. This is a U.S. military Mark 651 CS projectile recovered in the aftermath of the Mount Carmel fire. It is pyrotechnic and has a burning time of 25 to 30 seconds. It generates a distinctive cloud of white smoke. I am very, very troubled by the information I received this week suggesting that pyrotechnic devices may have been used in the early morning hours on April the 19th, 1993 at Waco. At this time, all available indications are that the devices were not directed at the main wooden compound, were discharged several hours before the fire started, and were not the cause of the fire. In the fall of 1998, unprecedented access to the Waco evidence lockers was granted. The pyrotechnic projectiles identified in the crime scene photos were missing from the evidence boxes. However, two additional 40 millimeter munitions were found. These devices are identified by the manufacturer's literature as pyrotechnic rounds. They were found in the rubble behind the compound. These munitions were examined, and the preliminary results indicated these devices may have passed through the wood structure. I mean, are you embarrassed by this all? I mean, you guys have had the evidence for six years, and then the Texas Rangers and the documentary filmmakers come in. I don't know how long this guy's been working on the film, but I'm not embarrassed, I'm very, very upset. 
The arson report fails to identify the specific instruments used to ignite the fires or the individuals that might have used those instruments. As a result, no arson charges were ever filed against any of the Branch Davidians. What is not covered in the arson report is the presence of the government's own pyrotechnic devices at the points of origin of the fire. This flashbang device, for example, was found in the rubble of the dining room. The flash that results as the detonation of this charge can cause a fire in any area where there is a high concentration of volatile vapors. In the evidence locker, there are six pyrotechnic flashbang grenades mislabeled as silencers or gun parts. According to the Texas Department of Public Safety, they were found in the southwest corner of the building, the dining room, and the chapel, all three points of origin of the fire. Now maybe the government, the FBI, the ATF did some wrong things, but they didn't light the fire. They didn't start the fire. That is not one of these questions that is very debatable. There are times when you cannot keep your job and put alternative explanations for data on the table. Any of us can think about, yeah, we'll stay in a building, burn up. I don't think many people would do it, and I don't understand why they didn't come out. At 12.10 p.m., the FLIR videotape shows at least two automatic weapons being fired into the back of the burning dining room, the only undamaged exit from the building. And what we have is we have men firing automatic weapons, and they're firing into the burning building. And like some sort of a cowboy movie, they're retreating down the building and firing as they're retreating. I cannot remember something more sickening that I had to do to witness this. According to the Justice Department report, at least 15 people were found shot to death at this location. The FBI conducted ballistic tests, which the Justice Department later termed inconclusive and rudimentary at best. Whether or not you argue that some people committed uh, suicide, yes, that may be, but I would say the majority of the people the bodies that I saw uh, were clear-cut homicide victims. When there was shooting going on and, and things like that, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek to then turn around and say, well, why didn't you come out? As a peace officer, you're trained that killing people and taking someone's life is the absolute last thing that you ever want to do, period. You signed on to help people. You didn't sign on to kill them. If the opinion is rendered that there was no shots fired from any other location other than from within the building, i.e., meaning the Branch Davidians shot themselves through suicide or homicide, then the government is left with a position that we are not going to do ballistics tests on anyone's weapons, whether they be bureau officials or other officials that might have been on the scene. The forensic evidence on the bodies themselves is very troubling. The bodies were preserved in a frozen or near frozen state inside two trailers for the purpose of examination. For some reason, those trailers who were under the control of the FBI uh, were allowed to uh, not have any electricity running to them, and the bodies deteriorated beyond which uh, any sort of forensic evidence could be gathered. And we were very, very troubled by that. The crime scene was declared a biohazard, and since the FBI predetermined that this was a mass suicide, the crime scene investigators were instructed to sift, wash, and bleach the evidence associated with the bodies, destroying much of its evidentiary value. I'm grinding up all the, the, the crime scene, and I'm saying to myself, well, what in the hell are they doing that for? Except for, are they conveniently trying to cover up something that they don't want the public to know? During the siege, 
some of the women and all of the children were sent to the bunker located in the center of the compound. The bunker was an old church records vault which had survived a fire several years before. It is here that the remains of some of the women and the young children were found. Based upon the fact that the majority of the women and children protected themselves by dousing themselves with water and blankets, trying to keep the smoke to a minimum, trying to prolong themselves their life in a nearly fireproof container, clearly demonstrates that they weren't embracing the flame, that they were trying to flee the flame. According to their autopsy reports, some of the children were still alive during the fire, but based upon the condition of their bodies, there was evidence of a deadly explosion. I read uh, that the FBI, on foot, entered the building, shot the Davidians, and planted an explosive device on top of the church vault that he called it. We referred to it as the bunker because it's a uh, concrete cinder block. Um, that's another theory that did not, could not have possibly happened uh, in this, this particular incident, referring to that explosion. The explosion happened well after the building was totally destroyed. Um, it, was, it was very unlikely that... Uh, that that explosion was anything other than a propane cylinder. The fireball was created by a ruptured propane tank on the ground adjacent to the bunker. But a large hole in the roof of the bunker has never had an official acknowledgement or explanation. What it tells me is that you had a demolition charge went off on the roof. General Ben Parton, a former military explosive expert, testify that there were two explosions. This footage shows the detonation of a high explosive device on the bunker, which appears to ignite gas from a ruptured propane tank. After completion of the FBI and Texas Rangers investigation, the bunker was bulldozed into rubble. Six years later, in 1999, permission was granted to test the residue from the blast. Strangely, however, that portion of the bunker was not found after a thorough search of the rubble. That's a child. I mean, that's just a that little bit. like a one-year-old. Yeah. yeah, see this? Boom. Yeah. You know? According to the FBI and ATF investigation, the Branch Davidians did possess some low-order explosives like gunpowder. But this would not be capable of penetrating six to eight inches of steel reinforced concrete like a high order explosive such as TNT. The, uh, the blast hole at the top of the roof, uh, you can plainly see the rebar is bent in. The damage to the stainless steel uh, refrigerator, which uh, appears to have been under the blast hole, is consistent with, with a shape charge and the blast being directed downward into the room in this enclosed concrete room would very likely cause some seam rupture and uh, create a, a huge overpressure inside the room that would uh, pretty much kill everybody in there. Anybody who was under uh, this device when it, was, uh, when it was blown would have been horribly mangled, uh, probably dismembered, pretty much like being thrown into a, uh, a grain thresher. Having uh, examined still photographs and videotapes of the bunker, it was apparent to me that this was caused by a shape charge. But what bothers me is who would have the audacity to use such a charge? Uh, rather than risk your own people going in there and trying to shoot it out with them, uh, it's, a standard, it's a standard tactic in uh, city fighting in military operations that built up terrain uh, to use explosives in this manner to uh, kill people in the targeted room that you're going to attack. The military's advice to the FBI was that it should focus on the leadership and capture or kill David Koresh. It was to our benefit that we were able to prevent him from carrying out the second part of his prophecy and that is that he intended to kill as many members of law enforcement as he could before his members were killed. It was to our benefit and we're most fortunate that number of our, none of our people were injured. Well, it's very obvious that uh, the effort 
that was demonstrated there assured that there would be no survivors in the church records vault. Was the Attorney General pressured by the White House to end the siege? What were the roles of Webster Hubble and Vince Foster? Who actually made the decision to use CS gas with 22 children inside the Davidian compound? After two years, why is there still no clear answer? Rangers had difficulties uh, working with the FBI. They had a major responsibility, we had our responsibility, and they seemed not to go hand in hand. And as I recall, I testified for Congress about having a name in the White House I could have called to solicit the support of the federal authorities in our objective. And it turned out to be Vince Foster. Mr. Hubble, do you recall a meeting on or about uh, the 14th or 15th of April that you attended with uh, Vince Foster, with uh, Mr. Nussbaum, and uh, I guess some others, in which was really a turning point. Did you or others at that meeting recommend, or was there any discussion about the use of military force or equipment? There was not any discussion about use of military force. There was discussion of having the military uh, evaluate the FBI's plan. The briefings by General Schumacher and Colonel Boykin of Delta Force gave Attorney General Janet Reno the assurances she needed to okay the FBI assault plan. Presidential Counsel Vince Foster was the White House's point man for the Waco affair. Ninety days later, Foster commits suicide. He had a lot of things on his plate at the time. The fire and the travel office being one, but nobody was killed in that one. What, what I think was really on his mind was, was Waco. Uh, I, to this day, I don't understand what he meant by the FBI lied to me. Mrs. Foster said that uh, her husband was depressed about a number of uh, matters, and uh, she ranked the Waco uh, tragedy very high, as uh, uh, any of us would who are responsible for such an activity uh, that re re resulted in such a tragedy. In this FBI 302 report, Mrs. Foster indicates that her husband was troubled by the deaths of the children at Waco and believed that everything was his fault. When you uh, are troubled by something and you feel responsible for something, you can only feel responsible for it if you could have done something about it. Perhaps Mr. Uh, Foster felt that he could have done something about Waco, whether he tried to intervene whether he was overruled. The extensive use of governmental privileges against grand jury and criminal investigations has, of course, been a pattern through this administration. Most notably, the White House cited privilege in 1993 to prevent Justice Department and Park Police officials from reviewing documents in Vincent, Vincent Foster's office in the days after his tragic death. The day after Vince Foster died, I got a phone call from a fellow who used to be on my squad, who uh, told me that they, not explaining who they were, but they had agreed that the FBI was going to come over and do a regular crime scene search of Vince Foster's office. During the Whitewater investigation, Deborah Gorham testified she saw a Waco file in the security file cabinet next to Mr. Foster's desk. In addition, Michael Chertoff, counsel for the Senate committee, inquired about a letter by Vince Foster involving Waco. Neither was ever recovered during or after the crime scene search, and their whereabouts are still unknown. However, White House Secret Service agent Harry O'Neill testified that Maggie Williams was seen removing files from Foster's office the night of his death. Thomas Castleton, an intern and Mr. Foster's assistant, testified that he had also removed a box of files. Just to let you know where we are in the state of the record, um, we have received evidence that, in fact, the box was in Mr. Foster's office. Did you understand the box you were taking up uh, was a box of files that originated in Mr. Foster's office? 
I did understand that, sir. You heard that from Maggie Williams? Yes. And in fact, it was Maggie Williams, the chief of staff to the first lady, that you accompanied in taking this box up to the residence, right? That's right. What were you told by Maggie Williams about why the box was being taken up to the residence? I was told that the contents of the box needed to be reviewed. Reviewed by whom? By the First Lady. Maggie Williams was Mrs. Clinton's chief of staff. Maggie Williams took out, can't be, you, you can't call it anything else but what it is. It was evidence. One of the interesting things that happens in an investigation is you begin to get anonymous phone calls. And we, in fact, received anonymous phone calls from Justice Department managers and attorneys who believed that uh, pressure was placed on Janet Reno uh, by Webb Hubble and pressure that came from the First Lady of the United States. Now, uh, we believed that uh, because the military was present at Waco in some capacity, that the president may have made a decision to allow that to happen following some sort of a legal protocol where he says this is of such a serious nature they need to be involved. And we asked for those documents and asked to see National Security Council documents and uh, were not provided with any information that uh, enabled us to reach a conclusion. It's a serious allegation that the president interfered with, changed, moved up the decision. And we can't just bandy these things around unless we have some real evidence. If Combat Applications Group was on the ground that day, uh, actually pulling triggers, uh, the origin of that operation would have come directly from the White House. It would have come from the President. Because Combat Applications Group is, for all intents and purposes, the President's private army. It was discussed at the meeting that the senior levels of the Clinton administration had authorized Delta to be deployed to Waco, Texas, and not just two or three people deployed there, but enough people there to get the job done. As we come to an end, uh, all of us are looking for anything that happened in these hearings after eight days and nights to uh, indicate not that, the, that General Reno had something to do with this, but now the president. Well, after we've exhausted that bit, the only one left that I can think of is the butler. Maybe the butler did it. I, I, I'm surprised you hadn't tried to subpoena the butler by now. Our disappointment could not have been greater as professionals and as humans who care about the plight of others when the investigation was terminated by Congress. As I count up the deaths here, 86, and then if you want to make the leap that Oklahoma City has some connection because it was done on the anniversary of Waco, that's another 160, give or take. So you're talking 246 lives, and for this Congress to try to oversee what in the hell happened and how did it happen, uh, it just seems to be talking about the butler did it, a little, a little capricious, a little frivolous, and that's just my uh, opinion. I yield my time to Mr. McCullough. It's a struggle we've had. I was Attorney General when the Freedom of Information Act was passed, and the government hated the Freedom of Information Act. They hated me for uh, pressing for it <clears throat> because they don't want to be questioned about what they do. They don't want to have to explain what they do. And yet, if you want to be a free society, if you want to have uh, justice, if you want to avoid um, a police state, you better know what your government does. You better insist upon a right to know what your government does. Even though you have a $20 million investigation, you don't have $20 million answers. There's nothing about Waco I feel good about, but imagine seeing small children disarticulated uh, with bullets and debris and having to pick up their body and their head comes off in your left hand and their body comes apart in your right hand. And, I mean, that leaves a horrible, absolutely indelible, etched in your brain uh, memory of a tragedy.
the prosecutors during our trial tried to prove conspiracy and murder and all 11 defendants were found by a jury to be not guilty of those two charges. And I think that uh, to me is f for the president and for any uh, media or, or anybody in this committee to continue to refer uh, to us as murderers, um, I feel that's unjust. The government cannot be proud about what they did on February the 28th. They cannot be proud about what they did on April the 19th. And they certainly can't be happy about what this jury said to them today. We found all of the defendants not guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and of murder. In essence, there was no way we could say that they did not use firearms. I think the jury totally rejected the scary idea that came out in final argument uh, that someone who would study a certain religion by virtue of the way he thinks would be guilty of a conspiracy to murder uh, federal agents. That, I think, is one clear message that came out of this uh, trial. What we came to realize, too late to correct, was that we could not have found them guilty of using firearms without having them found them guilty of either conspiracy to murder or murder. Those two charges were tied together. When the judge looked at the jury's verdict, he said this finding of guilty to commission of a federal offense is inconsistent. I'll throw it out. But then he changed his mind. And when it came to sentencing, he stood the jury's verdict on his head. He said in his sentencing speech that since they were guilty of using a weapon in the commission of a federal offense, he would find that the federal offense was murder and conspiracy to commit murder. He went further on to say, you murdered not only the ATF agents, but your own co-religionist. Federal sentencing guidelines allowed Judge Smith to choose a sentence of between five and 40 years. He gave all but two defendants the maximum sentence of 40 years in federal prison. I knew what was gonna happen. I knew what the agents were gonna say, what they're gonna blame myself and others in there for. But, uh, you know, it was just something I had to go through. I'm a school teacher and it's, you know, a good opportunity for me to get away from the kids and forget all about them for a while and just come and relax for a while. Paul Fatter was not at the initial February 28th shootout with the ATF but was charged with aiding and abetting and was also given a maximum sentence of 15 years. I don't like being in prison. You know, I don't like this situation. It's, it's a futile experience. I don't understand it. I don't think it's uh, making me a better person or it's, but I believe it's all for a reason. The system had every opportunity to be fair and honest and truthful and, and treat us properly, and they chose not to. They chose to lie, to deceive, and to cover up, to cover their positions or their retirement or their whatever it may be. And that's something they gotta deal with. They gotta look at themselves in the mirror every morning and say that, hey, I made decisions that ended up costing a lot of people their lives. I want to say that Branch Davidians are not anti-government. We're not anti-law enforcement. And I'm sorry that there are four agents that are dead and there are a lot that are wounded. But we lost 85 of them. Well, friends and family too. And it was unnecessary. I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, that they hope this will never happen again, what happened to us. Uh, I believe 
that what happened to us was just the beginning. Many of us had a heartfelt concern for individuals that chose to a particular lifestyle that was a little bit of an off-brand lifestyle and who were cavalierly thought of as unimportant and thought of as people who simply committed suicide or simply burned themselves up. And that claim, uh, being so widely held by everything, is also the type of thing that the investigator wants to get in under and really find out if there's another side to the story. They were my life. They meant everything to me, and they still do. And I thank God for the hope that one day, and I hope it's soon, that I'll be able to put my arms around them and play with them again and take care of them, God willing. We cannot put this government in the seat of God and go along with this government and say, look, you can take life anytime you well please, just like you did right before our very eyes. We had a play-by-play -play just like it was a football game. But you can't do this. You know, I think the media needs to be the watchdog for the people. I mean, that's why it's the First Amendment, if not the Second, not the Sixteenth. It's the First Amendment. Somebody way back when thought it was very important that the media be the watchdog. I mean, in this system of checks and balances, and in this instance, it, it, it was asleep. If we choose to learn from our mistakes, it is from admitting our errors that we come closer to understanding how we might prevent tragedies like these from happening in the future. Those who cannot admit their mistakes, well, all we can do is offer our prayers. Our government is an imperfect one, compromised of imperfect people. It can only be as good as we choose to make it. We have come too far to quit or to coast. We must continue to make it better. For we must not allow ourselves to become bitter, only better. Perhaps the greatest lesson to be learned is often the most difficult to remember until it's too late. And that is life is very precious. It happens in moments, not seconds, not minutes, not hours but in moments. And let us forgive, but let us never forget as we move from ashes to understanding.